Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode. I'm so excited that you decided to join me today because I'm talking about one of my favorite topics, which is basically mindfulness. In this episode, I'm going to be covering how more quiet time, more internal quiet time for you can equate to more love in your life, more self-love, more self-forgiveness, but also more love in general. So why am I talking about this? Well, I recently got back from a week-long meditation um, deep dive, basically meditation immersion, it was called, with my husband, Victor, and we went with our teacher, who has been our teacher since early 2000s sometime, I don't know, 2005 maybe. Um, his name is David G, and you'll be hearing quite a bit about him in this episode, because he is someone who was an incredibly, is an incredibly important person in my life, but when I met him and what I learned from him about meditation and how to finally get a dedicated practice going, that was a very powerful pivot point in my own life. So, let's get into the meat of it, shall we? Wait, this thing is a little onion, hold on. Okay, it's always backwards, there we go, okay. So let's start with, What did I learn? During this deep dive, besides all different kinds of breathing exercises, there were two full days of complete silence. So I'm pretty sure, unless I was passed out somehow, I've never in my entire life, even as a baby, had two days of um, intentional silence. I've always wanted to, I've always talked about it, But there's something very interesting that happened for me. So what did I learn about being in just two days? And I know that there are many people out there who've done 30 days of silence. And wow, good for you. I can't even imagine it. But what I thought, the first thing I'll say is that what I thought it was going to be like and how I thought I was going to feel, because we were still interacting with other people. There were 30 of us in this week-long immersion where we woke up every day and met at about 5.45 on the beach Um, he does this, the meditation immersion at a place that he calls The Nest in Carlsbad, California. So we would meet on the beach with our little back jacks and a bunch of blankets that they provide. And you're there when it's dark and as you're meditating, it's getting light. So we meditated for about 30 minutes to an hour every morning on the beach and then went and had breakfast stayed in silence when we were in the house before 9.15, you know, the, the area where we're actually meditating. And um, then nine, it was pretty much all day, 9.15 to probably 9 at night, every night. So you had breaks for food, but basically it really was an immersion with what we were learning. But I'm not sure what I thought the silence part was going to be. And Vic didn't know what we were doing at all. I just said, oh, we're doing something for a week with David G. And he was like, great. Then we got there. I was like, you know, there's going to be two days of silence during this thing. And he was like, great, because he expresses himself primarily if you don't know anything about my husband he is a he's an artist he's an illustrator so he draws this is how he communicates is in an artistic way I on the other hand talk 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 I need to be very succinctly understood I I talk quite a bit as you know hence I have a podcast a YouTube channel all these places where I can talk so I was a little bit nervous and I had a very interesting reaction to the first morning. So we had we were silent from midnight on the Wednesday night. So we were going to be silent all day Thursday, all day Friday. And by Friday night, we would then begin to talk and share our experiences. And throughout some of that time, we were doing silent activities, artistic things. And David G was um, also talking. He was also lecturing and sharing things. And we learned about breathing techniques and a whole bunch of other things. Anyway, So the morning when I woke up to go, after we did the morning meditation, came back to the room, it's almost like I felt compelled to sort of do a full face of makeup, which I thought was really interesting. Why would you do that on a meditation retreat? But it was like words and my ability to speak accurately and succinctly and say what I would like to say is also a protection because I pretty much am almost never at a loss for words, whether it's a rough situation, a confrontation, or a, a normal situation. 
So I, I looked at it later. I was like, why didn't you sort of go full face makeup for the 915 part of the course? And I really made a connection between it. it made me feel protected. It was like armor. I'm sure the other people in the group were like, well, what is she doing? But anyway, so that was an interesting self-observation. I thought it would be hard to not talk, but what I found was that it was um, a relief. It was easy. Instead of ha feeling like I need to sort of make sure everyone in the room is okay, even though I've, I've come so far from being the codependent that I used to be, you know, there's still a part of me that you can't turn off the antenna. You can protect your energy, but it's impossible to, for me to turn off that antenna. But because I knew I wouldn't be interacting with words with people, it was so much easier to stay on my side of the street, to be more self-contained, to be more reflective, to witness more of what was going on. So I was relieved. It was beautiful, right? But what I also learned something, that as much as I've been a psychotherapist for decades, I've, I've done many things that have to do with talking and listening, and especially when it comes to clients or in my group settings, I'm an excellent listener. I really discovered that in my life, and especially with Vic, because he's someone who knows me better than anyone else, who I feel like I know better than anyone else, that I don't know that I've been as good a listener with my husband as I've been with other people. So what I, when we could talk again, I was just observing all of the unnecessary things I would talk about. <laughs> like just talking, just filling space, just... And I don't mean asking questions. I mean like just shooting the shit about nothing, which really is an art form, but sometimes it block... I realized it was blocking me from other things that are important. So after we could talk again, Vic was telling me about a dream that he'd had. And it was this really deep, sort of a scary dream, and we were making different connections. But instead of me jumping in and analyzing the dream, or I just didn't talk much. I just asked a few questions, like, so what else? Or what do you think it's about? Or those types of things. And he told me something about his life in the past that he'd never told me. And it wasn't like he was keeping a secret from me. I probably talked too much for him to ever get it in edgewise, you know? So I, it was such a, a beautiful example of what you can learn. And for me, because I'm really talking about myself here, and I'm hoping that what I'm sharing will help you as well, is that what I really want in my life is to intimately know the people I love. That, that's it. it. It's yes, I want to be known and seen and heard as well. But I realized through this really profound experience with David G that there's so much more. I got so excited that there was so much more that I could be learning about this person, this my partner in life, my co-pilot, my one and only, that perhaps this compulsion to talk a lot was blocking me from. So I'm really psyched about that, and I've been super mindful since I've gotten back with my mother, with my, my sisters, with my friends, of just, you don't have to always know the answers. You don't have to always add an aside or to bring it back to myself of like, oh my gosh, yes. A lot of times I would, I would bring it back to myself. I, I would think what I was doing was making an identification with the person, like, yes, I understand you. But... What it really does is takes the attention off that person and then puts it on me. So it wasn't doing what I sort of in my mind thought it was doing. So anyway, that was a huge aha moment. And it was like, I also had a big realization about how much I use humor to interject into things. Um, but that also, that can be very intimacy blocking and not just intimacy blocking, but communication blocking, right? So even if I know the thing is really funny, the thing I could say is really funny and the timing is good, and that's a very specific skill, being quick on your feet for sure, but it comes at a cost is what I've realized through this process with David G. 
So, wow, this was really profound. So I'm going to share some of the things that I learned. And then I'm going to give you a list. So don't worry, you can just download. It's like a little cheat sheet for you. I'm going to give you some things that I really want you to try that I'm doing in my life. And that perhaps you creating more quiet time, more internal quiet time in your life will expand the love in your life as well as it's doing for me. So let's first start with the three gates. And this is a quote that is attributed to Rumi. Who knows with the online world? Did Rumi say it? Did, did Elvis say it? Did, you know, Nelson Mandela say it? We don't know. Um, and, you know, it's a long time ago, so Rumi's not around to tell us he didn't say it. So we'll I'll tell you what it is. The, the three gates. Before you speak, let your words pass through three gates. The first gate is, ask yourself, is it true? At the second gate, ask, is it necessary? And at the third gate, ask, is it kind? Now, I want you to imagine, because I have imagined, how much less I would talk if everything I said really needed to pass through those gates. How much different will my life be? How much different will my interactions be? How much more space would there be for just being? It's okay to be with someone that you love and be in silence. Enjoy the silence, right? And there's a lot of quotes about that. Like, is what you're you're gonna about to say, will it improve on the silence? And I think that they say that's Rumi too. Again, rumors. We don't know who said it. But the Quakers had something very similar, and they've been using this, I think, since like the 20s I was reading about. Um, and it's called the three sieves, like, you know, strainers, sieves. So to, and, and they're the same ones. So we know that there is something to this. And if you stop right now and think about how much of the time is what you're saying not true, not necessary, and not kind, that would really impact what you're saying. Um, another way of looking at this is through the, the Noble Eightfold Path, right? The, the, these it's Sometimes it's called like the Eight Paths of Yoga. And it's basically understanding, right, right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So this was like the Buddha's eight path. Um, so if we think about right speech, is like what you're saying coming from the right place. Will it add value? Um, will it do harm? Right? So these are things that we can think about when we're, talk, when we're thinking about how much we talk and what we talk about. Um, another thing for you to think about in this, and these are all the things that were impacting me and the notes that I was taking for myself, is this is something that's always impacted me, is Don Miguel Ruiz, right? the Four Agreements, those of you who are over the age of 35 probably heard of it, um, which is a book that came out, I believe, in the 80s, maybe 90s, and maybe, no, 90s, it was actually in the 90s, and um, one of the four agreements is to be impeccable with your word. And that also requires us to be mindful of what we're saying. So how can you be impeccable with your word? You can do what you say you're going to do. So don't say yes to something you know you can't do simply to avoid uncomfortable an uncomfortable conversation in the short run. Being impeccable with your word means speaking truthfully, authentically, honestly, and with kindness. Because a lot of times, and I think I talked about this last week a little bit, um, people use, like, I'm just being honest as, like, you know, as a big stick to, like, bash you in the face with, you know? And really... Is that just being honest or is that just your interpretation of the truth? And it's important. And in a lot of my classes, I have Boundary Boot Camp for ladies coming up in September. And we do a lot of um, discerning and making distinctions between what is truth, what is opinion, right? They're, they're different things. What is judgment? And it's very important to, to get that those things are all very different. None of us know sort of the truth. There's a universal truth. But since we're human beings, pretty much everything that we believe to be true is can only be seen through the glasses that we wear. It is our interpretation. 
or our opinion. A lot of times people will say that their opinion is the truth. And it's like, no, not really. That might seem true to you, but not necessarily so. So what do we need to do all of these things? What is it that we need? We need mindfulness, right? We need to want to change something. We need to be aware of how we're interacting with the world. What is going on around us in any given moment? This is being mindful. So since we've come back from the retreat, Vic and I have been meditating for an hour a day. Now that's 30 minutes in the morning where we're planting intentions and planting seeds and doing sutras and different things. But then in the afternoon, we were doing this meditation that actually David G, it's a body scan meditation that David G recorded. And I'm going to give you how you can get it. It is on Insight Timer, which is a free app and you can use it for free, which is great. So in my little, don't worry, in the downloadable thing, I'm going to tell you how to get it. But this is something that, that there were studies done about mindfulness. So in the 60s and the 70s, this Dr. Herbert Benson, he did studies on basically relaxation and the mind, right? So he is the founder of Harvard's Mind Body Medical Institute. And he's basically teaching us that we have the power to encourage our bodies to relax. And this is a physiological experience. And in some ways, it's like he demystified meditation and put it in terms that people who do not have this in their culture, which were basically Americans, could understand. So your personal ability, right, to, to give, to purposefully, intentionally tell your body, your organs to relax by going through this mindfulness experience. So what David G. did is he actually took the relaxation response information from Dr. Herbert Benson from the 60s and 70s and um, John Kabat-Zinn, who's basically the father of mindfulness now. He's got, um, he's got a mindful, um, mindfulness, a whole way of doing mindfulness that, so David G. took that as well and combined those two into this 22-minute guided um, relaxation. So apparently, if studies were done with this particular track that proved that if you did it for 56 days every single day, that it would change the structure of your brain. So it would shrink the fear center of the brain. And there would be an in increase in like the hippocampus, which is the forward part of the brain where decision making happens. And they also tied this into more self-forgiveness, hence why we would have more love in our lives, more love for ourselves, more love for other people. So I'm doing the challenge right now. I'm on day five. So if any of you would like to join me in committing to 56 days of this track that you can do for free and it's only 22 minutes long you can do it trust me i would love that so you can drop me a comment either on youtube or um, the podcast or on terrycole.com and tell me that you are in and let's do it together and see what shifts i'm noticing massive shifts internally for me because in the past two years some of you know after the, the really tragic death of my niece i couldn't really meditate in a dedicated way. I really tried, but you know, my many, many years of a dedicated practice kind of went to shit because I think I was afraid. I don't know, meditation and grief, that quiet space, they were too close and I every time I, I sat to meditate, I couldn't stop thinking about Lauren and so I didn't do it. So anyway, I've gotten over that because this immersion, I started meditating a month before because I knew that the immersion itself would be hell if I hadn't and I'm really grateful that I did because I feel so much better in my life. But I feel like I'm becoming also a better person, like a better listener, less of a know-it-all, less bossy, like, ew, it's just trying not to judge myself, but I do not like it. So mindfulness is key. So that is one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do is to create some kind of a daily practice. So the Insight Timer is one of my suggestions for you. I've given you the breathing app that Deepak Chopra um, 
that he created, which is also free, is another thing that you can use if you're not down for 22 minutes and you only can do five minutes, let's say. Maybe you're not there yet. That's fine. I understand. So that's going to be the first thing in our little to-do list to see what shifts for you. Second thing is let's really use the three gates. Can you use those three gates? Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? before you speak. And I'm not saying that you'll be able to never say anything that isn't all of those three things. But what if you really got mindful? What would change? Well, I can tell you what changed for me. You talk a lot less. That is for sure. The third thing I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to check in throughout the day. Tap into the wisdom of your body. Because again, this is mindfulness. What do you need? Just ask your body. What do you need? Because so many of us are so busy and we've become so habituated into not paying attention to the signals of our bodies. Even if it's saying we have to go to the bathroom, even if it's saying it's we're thirsty or we're hungry, that we just bypass those signals to like plow through our day. But that actually builds your non-mindfulness muscle. And what we're trying to do is build your mindfulness muscle in a way that you can still live your regular life, right? You can do all the things I'm asking you to do and still live your regular life, correct? Yes, you can. So, yes to that. And the last thing is I'm going to ask you at the end of the day to do what's called 4 by 4 breathing technique. It's very easy. So you can put it on your a notice on your phone so that you remember to do it. All you're doing is you're breathing in for four counts, you're holding it for four counts, you're breathing out for four counts, and you're holding it out for four counts. So let's try it right now, shall we? So ready? Inhale. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Release. Two, three, four. And hold. Two, three, four. So that is a very simple four by four breathing technique. And I'll ask you to do that four times in a row towards the end of your day and see if you don't have a different internal experience. And if you don't interact differently in your life, because I believe that you will. So I think that's going to be it for this episode. I think it is. I want to remind you, I'm going live in my YouTube channel, The Terry Cole Show Live. Um, It's going to be in May, so not this Thursday, not next Thursday, but the next one. So I'll I'll put the date in here because literally I don't know the date right now, but it's coming. So in the next couple of weeks. So look for it and please join me live. It was super fun the last time I did it. Next thing, I am doing a weekend at Kripalu. Those of you who live in the U.S., you know that it is basically a yoga and wellness center in the Berkshires, which is about 35 minutes from my house. And so I will put the link in there for that as well. I would love for you. It's for women only. I'm sorry, you guys. I swear I am creating things for you. But that weekend, so it's Boundary Boot Camp for Women. It's just a weekend where we're going to be doing a lot of mindfulness stuff and a lot of boundary stuff. So if you think you're interested, I believe it's the 13th to the 15th of September 2019. I would love to see you there. Um, What else did I want to remind you about? I think that's it for now. So I want to say thank you so much. If you like the show, if you think that it added any value to your life, please share it with the people in your life that you love. Help me spread the TC love of positive world domination. I super appreciate you watching, you listening, and you sharing. I hope you have an amazingly quiet week. And as always, take care of you.